there are plenty of gaming achievements worth being proud of. I myself once nearly finished Skyrim, but then it got a bit hard, so I stopped. Message if you want my strategy guide. Some games, however, take the whole overcoming adversity thing and crank it so hard the dial falls off, creating brutally difficult game modes that only the seriously skillful or willfully masochistic would want to take on. Here are eight of the hardest modes that we will never ever attempt, let alone finish. A call went out just before I picked you up, said it was multiple homicides. Half a dozen units already on scene. 131, please advise. Hey, maybe it's the ghost of that doctor who went schizo and chopped up all those patients. That's not what happened. There are many words we'd use to describe the evil within. Harrowing. <laughs> gruesome. <laughs> and, well, it's, it's not really a word, but... Uh? Is everyone else all right? The city. Whatever are you talking about? You are the only soul here. Right now. One word we definitely wouldn't use to describe it, however, is easy. Which is why we were somewhat taken aback to discover that there are two difficulty levels above the game's regular survival difficulty. Nightmare and Akumu. Now, as you may have guessed from the name, Nightmare is no walk in the barbed wire covered park. But Akumu, which is Japanese for Nightmare, is even harder than that, in that if you take so much as a single hit from anything, you die instantly. If you played The Evil Within, you'll remember that pretty much all of the game is things trying to hit you, often all at once, in large groups. You have to never get hit by anything in a game where your character is about as mobile as a dumpster full of house bricks. Akumu completion percentage among Evil Within players is currently sitting in the low single digits, so it's provably doable, but it's a bit like deliberately running yourself over with your own car. Technically an impressive feat, but you've got to wonder why you went to all that trouble just to make yourself miserable. The seeds of life grew and strengthened, spread and diversified. Now it required but one more ingredient, a great leader to unite the quarreling tribes, to harness the power of the land, to build a legacy that will stand the test of time. Running a nation state is hard work. Just ask any of the former citizens of the short-lived nation of Andytropolis. Or I mean, you could ask them if there'd been any survivors. It's even harder though when every other country in the world is a supernaturally advanced superpower with no flaws who hates you. That's what happens in strategy game civilizations' higher difficulties. Instead of making the AI more intelligent and resourceful, it just provides them with a succession of powerful buffs that mean you're always on the back foot. The worst example of this is the series Deity difficulty mode, which grants your enemies godlike abilities while you get zip. It's like the computer is playing with cheats on. Cheats are only fair when I'm using them, damn it! To use Civilization VI as an example, Deity Difficulty gives the AI a 32% boost to science, culture and faith, plus 4 in combat, an additional 40% to unit XP, research boosts, more starting units, and a staggering 80% to production and gold, meaning that every other civilization you come up against will be sending in the equivalent of Pacific Rim Jaegers while you're still trying to teach your citizens how to make fire. So you take them and you rub them together. Guys, guys, put the rock down. Guys, you're not listening! Alright, I, I know you're confused right now. But I can explain everything, but you gotta trust me, okay? Listen, you're in terrible, terrible danger. It's hard to imagine, but there was a time when you couldn't save in video games. In those dark days, losing all your lives meant starting over. So let's give thanks to Dead Space 2's hardcore mode, which allows you to save three times in the entire game. Checkpoints are disabled too, so if you're evenly spacing your saves in this 10 hour game, that's about one save every three and a bit hours, which is three and a bit hours worth of backtracking you'll have to do if you die. And if you remember anything about Dead Space hero Isaac Clarke, it's that he's always dying. There he is, at it again. Well, good luck trying to get him to stop in your Dead Space hardcore playthrough, as the Necromorphs are much tougher and do a lot more damage in hardcore mode. And you'll spend a lot more time crying and panicking when they get near you because you don't want to lose three hours of progress. Right? Just, just me? Dead Space 3 also included hardcore mode, but thankfully updated it so that you can save it as many times as you want. Until you die, at which point it erases your save and dumps you back at the start of the game. 
Still, I'm confident Isaac knows what's at stake here. I can trust him to not die just when it's most inconvenient. Right, Isaac? <laughs> oh, we can't blame Isaac. He's just like Bonnie Tyler. Every now and then he falls apart. Toho Project is a series of Japanese shooters in the genre known as Bullet Hell. So named because hell, that's a lot of bullets. Toho games are nightmarish whirlpools of deadly projectiles at the best of times, but it takes a certain kind of masochist to attempt one of the series games on lunatic difficulty, described as for weird people. Hey, <laughs> you said it Toho, not us. The aim of bullet hell shooters, as with most shooters, is to keep yourself away from your enemy's bullets. But it's a task which is easier said than done when literally 99% of the screen is bullets, as is usually the case in a lunatic Toho stage. Think of it like a hedge maze, only the hedges are bullets, and if you touch them, you die. You need to find that 1% of the screen that it's safe to be in, and it's a different 1% every second because these things are fast and unpredictable, and you need to have the reaction speed of a hummingbird on caffeine pills if you're going to stand any chance. Look, there's fighting bravely against seemingly insurmountable odds, then there's this. I've seen the way things are going. The future belongs to the bullets, and I for one welcome our new bullet overlords. If we join them now, maybe they'll let humanity live on in some kind of humiliating servant position. Get a kind of Theon Greyjoy thing going on. Guys, the bullets are probably thinking it over. So if we get this thing, I can help me and we can get out of here? Right, and so can I. The old house is near the water. You can't miss it. All right. I just hope you can handle my mother. Resident Evil 7 sets its stall out early with the name of its ultra-hard survival mode, Ethan Must Die, because you, Ethan, must die due to all the deadly stuff that happens to you. Ethan Must Die mode is a remixed section of the main Resident Evil 7 game, in which you have to make your way to the Baker family greenhouse to kill Marguerite, who you'll remember as being absolutely the worst and mostly made of bees. Don't leave, Cher! Stay! It's busy! That's a kind offer, but I think I'll pass. In Ethan Must Die mode, you start with a pocket knife and nothing else, and the enemies are much, much tougher, often able to kill you in a single hit if you're not blocking. Also, the house is now covered in deadly, deadly traps. <laughs> Items are found in crates around the house, but the crates are randomized, so you never know what you're going to get, from a life-saving weapon, to relatively useless gunpowder, to a massive explosion in the face, because yes, some of the crates are booby-trapped. They should call this mode Ethan Definitely Will Die. To add insult to fatal injury, dying in this mode sends you right back to the beginning and you have to start all over. But don't worry, if you can make it back to where you died previously, you'll find an angel statue that if you break it open, gives you back your item. That's item singular because you only get one of the items you died with back and it's chosen randomly. You're welcome. Still, you must get something pretty awesome for beating a mode this difficult, right? You sure do, if you consider an overexposed picture of Ethan looking at his hands awesome, which, I mean, we all do, right? Totally worth it. Given that when I try to play Guitar Hero drums on Expert, I look like a spider trying to climb out of a bath, the Expert Plus mode was not exactly at the top of my Christmas list. And yet that's exactly what Activision introduced in Guitar Hero Metallica, to reflect the fact that Metallica's fastest drum solos sound like someone strafing the drum kit with a machine gun. In order to play Expert Plus mode, which only applies to certain songs, you'll not only need to have mastered Expert drums and be able to keep better time than Lars Ulrich himself, you'll also need to invest in an additional kick pedal for your Guitar Hero drum kit. I mean, technically you can play Expert Plus with a single kick pedal, yeah, if you, you know, want to grow an additional foot on one of your legs. It's not just managing twice as many kick drum notes though. Also introduced in Expert Plus are Ghost Notes, which are the restless spirits of notes who have unfinished business on this mortal plane. Alright, the truth is far less exciting. 
Ghost notes are actually just softer notes designed to keep drummers in rhythm. To play them, you had to tap the drum pad softly in amongst all the harder proper notes, because we didn't have enough to be thinking about already Guitar Hero Metallica. The end result is a selection of the fastest, most complex drum patterns in any rhythm action game, and a really excellent way to develop RSI of the ankle. What? That is too a thing. I used it to get out of a whole year of sports at school. I'm willing to take full responsibility for the horrible events of the last 24 hours, but you must understand our interest in their world was purely for the betterment of mankind. Everything has clearly gotten out of hand now, yes. But it was worth the risk, I assure you. Nightmare, or Nightmare, if you're pronouncing the exclamation point, was the toughest difficulty setting in the original Doom. A difficulty setting that last year's Doom reboot took one look at, laughed, and then stubbed a cigar out on. That's because this Doom has a difficulty level called Ultra Nightmare, which is so difficult that no one who actually worked on the game could complete it. The premise of Ultra Nightmare is simple. You take regular Nightmare mode, which is, as the name implies, an absolute nightmare, then apply permadeath to it, so the second you die, you're booted back to the start of the game and your save is erased. No saving means you've got to do it all in one sitting too, or at least hope you can leave your console paused and not have someone switch over to Netflix while you're in the bathroom. Still, people are up for the challenge, despite the game specifically asking you if you're willing to put yourself through this punishing ordeal the first time you select it. Ha! You're not the boss of me, game. Okay, maybe you know best, game. Super Hexagon is a simple game. You control a little triangle that moves around a hexagon, fitting between the gaps in waves of lines that endlessly approach you. Fine. What Super Hexagon isn't, is an easy game, as even on the earlier difficulties, the game throws lines at you faster than an actor with places to be. Hyperhexagonist mode, though, described by the game as its hardest disc dis mode, is so fast, so confusing, and so mind-meltingly difficult that you'd be forgiven for thinking you're not looking at a game anymore, and in fact have found some kind of CIA brainwashing technique from the 1960s. Does anyone else have a sudden urge to overthrow communism? Get even further in hyperhexagonist mode and it will switch into a black and white mode. The music will slow down and start playing backwards and you'll start hearing the voices of your long dead ancestors telling you that the secret to the universe can be unlocked if you can draw a perfect hexagon freehand. Is that just me? I think I may have been playing too much super hexagon. Getting there though. Wow, all of that looked really, really hard. But you know what's easy is pressing either of these two videos to watch something else from us or from our sister channel, Outside Extra. And the easiest thing of all is clicking on the subscribe orb here because then you don't even have to go looking for videos that come straight to your subscription box. It's the easiest thing in the world. So do it now. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.